day by day to be presented in all of its splendor to your son Jesus. Therefore, to give you the honor and glory today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we continue our discussion this morning on unity, I think one of the things, one of the things I want to say right away um, is this is not intended to be a doom and gloom Sunday. And I don't want you to think by way of some of the comments that I've made, um, by way of the introduction and, and, um, and acknowledging different things. Listen, this is not a death sentence or anything like that for our church. Um, but I, 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 one of the things I've always appreciated about the leadership of the church here is they've always encouraged me when it's time to preach hard things. They've never discouraged me from preaching hard things. And I will submit to you as we begin this morning that for some of us, perhaps most of us, what we're going to examine today in Ephesians 4 may be hard to hear. I'm, I'm thankful, I'm so thankful for the leadership um, that has encouraged me as I've met with our elders and I've talked with our elders um, and knowing that they're okay with me preaching hard things as long as it's the Word of God. And so I'm thankful as I pray that the Word of God speaks truth into our lives even when it's difficult. But again, difficult doesn't mean a death sentence. Difficult doesn't mean a doom and gloom. Sometimes difficult just means maybe not what we wanted to or what we were hoping to hear at a given time. And so this morning, as we've mentioned already, we'll continue our discussion on unity. And I do want to say, as I've alluded to already, a couple of things by way of introduction. Uh, first of all, I don't believe that our month-plus-long Discussion on Sunday mornings of a unit of unity has happened by chance. Uh, it's crazy to think that back in June, with no knowledge whatsoever of what October would look like, we began examining the book of Ephesians, and in the midst of a pretty difficult time, just in general, we found ourselves discussing unity. I don't believe that this has happened by chance because I believe that God is perfectly sovereign and in his perfect sovereignty, he has led us to and will continue to do the discussion of unity. And secondly, I believe it's important that we have the discussion personally on unity because the reality is that with every day that passes, if we are not careful, we will, we will progress toward disunity. But the reason I don't believe this is doom and gloom is because this is not reserved for Dale Bible Church. This is a reality of church right now. Every day that passes, if we're not careful, we can become less and less unified. And I'm going to be honest with you. As a pastor, as a pastor of this particular body of Dale Bible Church, it saddens me to think that we're heading towards disunity. It saddens me to think that the church as a whole, not just here, but as a whole, is headed towards disunity. And this isn't just simply because a church that is not unified cannot fulfill its mission to proclaim the gospel and, and reach lost souls for Christ. This is also because I'm just going to be, I'm going to level with you this morning. We cannot believe, we cannot expect God is pleased and not grieved and blessing a body that is not unified. So if we don't recognize that we, if we are not careful, we can become disunified, we have to understand that in not being unified, we are forfeiting the blessing of God upon the body of their Bible church. Again, I don't believe that this is unique to us. I believe that this is something that many churches are facing as a whole. The reality is the church is called to be a unified entity, unified by way of its demonstrating its love for Jesus and doing so changes the world. But how does a church that if it's not careful begins to experience less and less unity, how does that church demonstrate the love of Jesus to the world? How does a church that, if it's not careful, begins to lack the love for one, of one another, how does it demonstrate the love of Jesus to the world around it? And I'm going to be very frank with you this morning and give you an example. I'm going to give you an illustration of how I believe our church is teetering on really experiencing the fracture of the lack of unity. 
I'm, again, I'm not sounding alarms this morning, um, but we need to be real. We need to be honest. We need to be transparent. Now, again, I want you to keep in mind this is just one example. Okay, there could be others, and everything that church and, that we talk about and everything that churches talk about isn't you know specific to this. But this is just one example. For the past eight months, <laughs> be surprised this is my example. As we all know, we've been living in the midst of what is no doubt perhaps the most uncertain time of almost all of our lives. Um, mo most of the folks uh, that make up Dale Bible Church, I think it's fair to say that this has been the most uncertain, abnormal time of their lives. In the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of the unknown, there is no greater need than patience for one another, grace with one another, love for one another. I'll be honest with you, eight months ago in March when everybody was going crazy and Things were changing across the map, and what does this look like and that look, look like? I'll be honest with you. I was a bit naive. I halfway believed that Dale Bible Church would be immune to the issues that would surface. But the constant changing information that was being given to us, as well as trying to constantly make decisions of how to respond to that information, really has proven to be too much to overcome. I hope you know that with great regularity, the elders of Dale Bible Church have met to consider all the information that's been made available, and then take that information and do the best that we can to make the best decision that we could for the body of Dale Bible Church. You see, the reality of the current situation for the folks who make up the church and who have up until now been a part of the church, the reality of the situation is there is a spectrum that exists. A spectrum you're all very familiar with. One end of the spectrum says this is the second coming of the Black Plague. The other end of the spectrum says this is nothing more than a hoax. And then there's everything in between. Everything in between. Over the last few months, couple months really, I want you to know that I have been contacted and advised that we should shut church down. Because things are running rampant, I've also been told that we need to go back to normal. So let me ask you the question as we consider the potential for disunity this morning. What's the right response for the leadership at Dale Bible Church? And not just what's right, but what's right to preserve unity? How does such a, a polarizing, uh, 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 not a group of polarized individuals, but polarizing opinions of individuals and decisions trying to be made in light of all of those, how do you make a decision as a leadership team that's going to continue to promote and preserve the unity that we have experienced? Now, I want you to understand that my goal this morning is not to tell you how to feel in regards to the coronavirus I cannot do that for you, nor will I attempt to do that for you. But I will tell you that the coronavirus, among other things, has the potential to wreak havoc on Dale Bible Church's unity. Have you ever thought about that? The coronavirus, among other things, but right now it's the coronavirus, has the potential to wreak havoc in the body, or the unity of the body at the Bible Church. I want you to understand something. From this, I'm grieved. I'm grieved. Sometimes I look around and I think, good lands. We're, we're barreling towards, I want to be careful, barreling may be a bit extreme. But it doesn't take much to be barreling. And we have to be careful. It grieves me. And as I've said already, I believe, more importantly than grieving me, I believe it grieves our Savior. How quickly folks turn on one another in the body of Christ in the midst of difficulty. What is exceptionally scary for me to consider 
is that a day is coming where following Jesus will actually be difficult. This issue has been a polarizing issue, but the truth is, it really hasn't made it to continue to follow Jesus. It's made it inconvenient in some cases. It's made it different in some cases, but it hasn't made it difficult. You see, what we're currently experiencing is nothing compared to what at some point you and I, especially those of, of the younger generations, are sure to face. And what happens to the body, not just at Dale, but what happens to the body of Jesus Christ then? When real persecution surfaces, and I'm not saying that there's not churches that aren't being persecuted. We all know what's going on around our country in some different areas and some different churches. But I'm talking about when meeting in church comes with the threat of harm. When trying to gather for fellowship and worship and, and studying of the word of God is accompanied by the threat of danger. What happens then? How does the church today, and how does Dale Bible Church specifically, avoid the pitfalls of succumbing to any and every difficulty that the church faces? And we're going to face more. I wish this was going to be it. Who knows? You know? I don't know how long this coronavirus is going to continue to carry on. It's probably not going away. It's probably not just going to disappear. How do we at Dale Bible Church put ourselves in a position that enables us to avoid the pitfalls of succumbing to the difficulties that the church is sure to face? I will submit to you this morning, I really believe, I really believe that it starts with recognizing our responsibility to the church. And it's interesting to me that this is where we blame it. We've been in Ephesians for five months. Five months we've been in the book of Ephesians. Preached, I don't know how many sermons, numerous in recent weeks, in the last couple months, on unity. And here we are, coming to the conclusion of the conversation on unity, and the reality that unity requires the people of the church to fulfill their responsibility. To the church. I'm going to give you two things this morning. Okay? I'm just going to give you two areas of responsibility. And I'm going to tell you as I begin. None of us are not in these areas of responsibility. You know, Pastor Aaron stood up here a few minutes ago and, and said, you know what? We're, we're, we're getting children's church going next month. You know, we've heard some of the folks of Dale Bible Church say, you know, it's really hard to be at church when there's nothing for our kids, there's no nursery. No. We understand that. And so we're working really hard to try to make some of these things possible. Okay, but you got to understand, we can't offer ministries without the help of the people. It takes all of us. And that's part of this conversation with the reality of the responsibility of the people. But before Paul touches on the responsibility of the people, Paul first in verses 11 through 14 talks about the responsibility of of the leadership. I want to read these few verses for you again. He says, beginning in verse 11. Again, you might recall a couple times, a couple weeks back when we watched on the video, uh, we spoke of the reality of all the individuals in the church having a gift. Christ has given gifts to his church. And then last week, Pastor Aaron talked about we have to stay focused upon Jesus. Ultimately, that's where our focus lies as we promote uh, and seek unity in the church. But he says this, Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craft, and deceitful schemes. The responsibility of the leadership. Now, I don't want to take too much time this morning. I'm really not going to take much at all to exhaust the various types of leaders that God has given to the church. Because I do not believe that the primary point that the Apostle Paul is communicating in this portion of the text is on the specific giftedness of the leaders of the church. Right? He's 
shifted, however, from the variety of the gifts that have been given to the church, again, we saw this a couple weeks ago, and turned his attention, and by the way, his attention, our attention, to those that Christ has given specifically to help oversee and promote the health and well-being of the church. It is the teaching that God has given these very specific types of leaders for very specific purposes in regards to the church and its functions. Now, as we move past verse 11 and into verses 12 through 14, there's a bit of debate in regards to what Paul is saying over these next few verses. Some translations, perhaps the translation you have this morning, it separates each of these three phrases with a comma. All right? And if that's the case, uh, I want you to understand that these commas, this uh, conversation about these few verses, his... his it's consisted of quite a, quite a bit amount of debate over the years. Because separating these three phrases with commas would indicate that Christ gave the leaders that he references in verse 11 for the purpose of accomplishing three things. That's how this text would read. In verse 11, Christ gave these people so that in verse 12 they would do this, in verse 13 they would do this, and in verse 14 they would do this. But I want you to understand this morning. The reason there's been a lot of debate is because this would cause some difficulty in this rendering, however, would cause some difficulty or some issues. First is the difficulty that if this, trans, this, this portion of scriptures could be translated with commas, indicating that leaders were given to do A, B, and C, that would mean that Paul is saying that the ministries of the church are all to be performed by the pastors, by the leaders. Okay, that's not consistent with what Paul says three verses later. Okay, so the context says that rendering is not accurate. Okay, second is the reality that um, uh, it takes the entire body to fulfill the function of the body. Right? The, Paul uses the illustration of a body elsewhere and here, and because he uses this illustration of a body to describe the church. We understand that he's saying one part of the body can't do all of the work for the body. The body is made up of many members. And, and uh, being made up of many members, they serve different functions. And all of those members working together fulfilling the body ultimately fulfills the function and purpose of the body as a whole. And just simply put, that's kind of the reality of what Paul is saying here. Talking specifically in our passage about experiencing unity, Paul says you got to have everybody involved. So, so just practically looking at the um, context of the text and what Paul says, we can come away understanding why there's been debate and understanding that Paul is not saying it is the job of the leadership to do all of the work. I'm going to be frank with you for just a second. In a lot of churches today is that's the perspective of ministry. I'm just going to be blunt. That's what we pay the pastor for. This model will never produce a healthy church. Never. Never. Because number one, there ain't enough people to do the work of the body. You can't do it. It takes everyone. The body doesn't function to its fullest when I kind of laughed, I was, one of the commentaries I was reading this week, uh, the commentary was talking specifically about the pastor and how, um, not by any stretch of the imagination, do I consider myself a celebrity pastor, okay? But there's been a lot of comments that have been made here about being a young and energetic and exciting pastor and, and um, just all kinds of things, okay? Listen, that can't be the lifeblood of the church because I can't do it. We want to hire somebody else to help. And we can't do it. So though the leadership has a responsibility, we'll talk about this in just a second, we have to understand that the responsibility of the leadership is not to do all of the work. And so what I would submit to you this morning is that Paul is not saying here there's three separate things that the, that the leaders of the church do, and that's fulfilling all of the function of the church. I would submit to you this morning that what Paul is actually communicating is that as the leadership of the church does the first thing, 
The second flows out of that, and the third flows out of that. So that's what we're going to talk about here in just a second. The purpose of the leadership or the leaders that God has given to a body of believers primarily is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Did you catch that? My primary job, Pastor Aaron's primary job, even the lay leaders of the church who are not paid, that's why they're called lay leaders, their primary function is not to do all of the ministry, but to equip you to do the ministry. I'm convinced, sadly, that this is mind-blowing to many people in our churches today. Not our church, but in our churches. And I think in our case, in, in some people in our case, in our churches. The primary uh, function and responsibility of the leaders is to equip the people to do the work. And so it's important for us to recognize what Paul is communicating. Let me touch on some of this. He is not saying it's the responsibility of a select few to do all of the ministry. I love what Paul says here. Because what he's communicating in verse 12, when we look at it again for you, he says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. I love what he says here because it's clear that the body is built up, as I've alluded to, not when the leaders are dynamic. Paul says the body is built up when the body does the work of ministry. Uh, I want to be very careful because Paul is not relieving the leaders of the church of the responsibility to be involved in the work of ministry. But it's very <laughs> clear that Paul is saying that it's not up to the leaders to perform all of the functions and everything that needs to be done to fulfill the work of the ministry. It's important that we recognize this because whether or not our leaders are free to equip others to do the work of ministry goes a long ways, not just towards fulfilling the function ultimately, but to growing believers to maturity. You see, one of the things that you have to understand and we have to understand and grow in our understanding of is that the, the leaders are, as they're working with people, the purpose and function is to help people grow into maturity, ultimately. We want to see people, listen, that's why if you've ever been involved in ministry, youth ministry, kids ministry, jail ministry, old people ministry, young people ministry, if you've ever been in ministry and you've had the privilege of sharing the word of God with someone over a period of time and then you get to be with them the moment it clicks and it makes sense for them and all of a sudden in the blink of an eye they begin that quest of growing in maturity to be like Jesus Christ you want to do backflips you see the lifeblood of a ministry is not dynamic leadership it's not even good if it's not dynamic leadership that's not the lifeblood the lifeblood of ministry is when people are brought face to face with the word of God, understand their position before God as a sinner. They see their need for repentance and by faith place their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. When that happens, you know what that makes you want to do? Preach! It makes you want to go. It makes you want to do it. But what we have to understand expectation is that leaders are just going to do everything that has to be done in the church. There is no opportunity. There's less, I shouldn't say no, there's less opportunity to, to put people on that fast track of being equipped and being matured in Christ, which is the second thing, the second function that, again, it's the responsibility of the leadership to do all of these things, but they, they play a role in encouraging the believers to maturity. What's he say? He gave the body, okay, uh, to be equipped for ministry. He gave the ministry, equipped the uh, body for the work of ministry until we attain the unity, there's our word, of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to what? To mature manhood. The leaders who are able to depend upon the members of the body to do the work of the body are able to focus less on getting stuff done. I want you to understand something. Uh, over the last probably year, two, year and a half, we've had a lot of conversations as a leadership team about how to free Pastor Aaron and myself up from doing stuff. 
so that we can be free to do ministry. Now, I'm not saying that as an indictment upon you guys, okay? I'm just simply saying it's really easy, especially when you're built like I am. I'm like, oh, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. And now I'm over here focusing on stuff. But my focus, Pastor Aaron's focus, has to be on equipping people in order that we can encourage them to maturity. Because this is the goal, after all, not only for the individual, but for the body of Christ as a whole, to grow to maturity in Christ. And I love that Paul again says, part of growing to mature manhood is striving to attain the unity that is based upon the substance of the believer's faith. Go back to verse 5 of Ephesians 4. One faith, one Lord, uh, one baptism. There has to be a, a common unity and understanding of, of faith. Our goal, our goal not just as a body, but my, my prayer is that you understand that your goal as a professing believer of Jesus is to be growing into maturity in Christ's likeness. Part of that growing to maturity in Christ's likeness is fulfilling your function uh, in the body to help others do the same. We ought to strive for Christian maturity. We ought to strive to pursue and to be like Jesus. How long does a member of the body of Jesus have to strive to attain this maturity? All of their life. All of your life. If you profess faith in Jesus Christ, the call of Scripture upon your life is to now spend the rest of your life pursuing maturity in Jesus. And the, the leader of the church is given to help you on this path. But you have to understand, I, or Aaron, or the most dynamic, gifted uh, speaker that you can ever encounter, cannot grow you to maturity in Jesus Christ. Please understand that this morning. I don't have the ability to grow anybody. But I do have the ability, because God has said so, not because I'm great. But I do have the ability to encourage uh, the body, to equip the body in order that you can grow in your understanding of your need to grow personally in your maturity and in your pursuit of Jesus Christ. And that you're to spend your whole life doing it. And the reality is that life, that Christ, that full maturity will one day be attained at the end of your life of pursuing Christ's likeness, it'll be attained not because of your merit, not because you spent your life pursuing it, but because Jesus and his righteousness has been given to you through his death, burial, and resurrection, and your faith in it. Leaders equip and encourage. And lastly, leaders are free. I want you to understand, as the leaders equip and encourage, and the people understand they're equipped, and they, they, they respond to that encouragement, and they're growing in maturity, it frees the leadership up to um, educate about the potential missteps of life. I have meant to put these sub-points in my notes. I'm sorry, I forgot. But understand that leaders have the opportunity to educate followers of Jesus about the potential missteps of life. This is verse 14. You see, Paul contrasts the mature person of verse 13 to the child of verse 14. He says, you pursue maturity in the fullness of Christ so that you may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. He says some other things, but well, doctrine, he says some things, we'll stop there. And Paul uses two metaphors here to describe the person who's not growing into maturity in Jesus Christ. He says, he refers to them first as a child. The same way that if you have children, you educate them to the potential dangers of their missteps, the leaders of the church are given to educate the people of the church about the danger of their missteps. Right? We teach our kids things. Don't put that in the light socket. Don't touch the stove that's hot. As they get older, we teach them things like, don't go into the road. Why? Because going into the road is dangerous. Because touching a hot stove is dangerous, and it's harmful. 
The other metaphor that Paul uses here is that of a ship. You've all seen, you can all visualize and imagine the picture of a ship on rough seas. If you can't, maybe jog your memory and you can remember with me, last spring, Jenna and I went on a cruise. And I'd never been on one. I'm not a fan of the ocean. I was a bit terrified. And like two months before we went on our cruise, you guys it was an Alaskan cruise liner that somehow hit enter and went out on a sail and it shouldn't have. And it got caught in this storm. And of course, because we live in a media saturated day and age, all these videos surfaced of the people in the boat. And they were like in the dining hall. And you could see the whole boat more like this. This way, and everything, it was, it was rocking so hard that everything in the ship was sliding over here, and the people were hanging on to anything that was fastened to the floor, and then the boat would go back this way, and everything that just slid this way, slid all the way back down this way. How many people do you think on that ship enjoyed what they were experiencing? None. I don't have to ask them to know. And you know what's interesting about what Paul says here about the leader's ability? educate away from missteps is that missteps are a lot like touching a hot stove when you're a child or being on a ship that you can't get off of that's caught in, I don't know, a tropical storm or hurricane or whatever it was. It's not fun. It's not healthy. It's not good for you. And you're going to come to regret it. And that's what Paul says here. In maturity as a believer, and you're still operating and, and just being tossed to and fro, everything that comes along, you say, oh, that sounds good, I like that. But is there substance to it? Is it truth? You may not know why, because you're not growing to maturity in Christ through the intake of his word. So believer, believers have been given leaders to help educate, right? Right? There's a reason that we say, don't do that. There's a reason that we say, listen, and you've heard me say this before, okay? Church is important. Believers need to be in church. They need to be with the body. They need to be under the word of God. They need to partake in worship. And sadly, the coronavirus... And I'm not trying to, you know, make, you know, minimize it or make light of it. I understand that there are, are people who have to take extreme precautions, and I get that. But sadly, the coronavirus has given a lot of people a reason to withdraw from church. But we need to be in church. We need to be together. I don't care how much Bible study you do and how much prayer time you have every day. You need to be with other believers. It's vital. It's vital for the health and well-being. It's part of the functioning of the individual members of the body functioning together so that the body can uh, flourish and, and, and thrive. And Paul's telling the church at Ephesus and Timothy, if you don't know and understand and recognize the pitfalls of false doctrine and human craftiness and deceitful schemes, that you're going to fall victim to them. You're going to fall prey to believing that you don't need to be in church. Well, like I said, take the coronavirus out of the equation. What's next? What's it going to take to keep us? What does it take to keep us from partaking together? See, the leader has the responsibility to shepherd the people entrusted into their care in such a way that they're encouraged and educated. But they do this. They do this for a purpose. They do this so that the people will understand their responsibility. And we, of course, touched on this as we walked through this. But verses 15 and 16, they shed light for us uh, to the responsibility of the people of the church. And I want to begin, as we talk about the responsibility of the people, I want to begin and communicate something very clearly, as, as clearly as I can, and up front. So please hear me when I say this. Everybody in the church is not a leader, okay? But everybody in the church is a people, including the leaders. So while everybody may not fill the function of a leader, even the leaders fill the function of the people. 
Just because God has given leaders to help encourage, equip, and educate the people doesn't mean that those people uh, don't have, a, or those leaders don't have, also have a responsibility as the people. That's why I always say, I preach the word of God, I preach it like this. Oh, I just tore my Bible. They preach the word of God like this. So that it comes here first and then out to you. I pray that I never deliver the word of God from a position that says, you need this, I don't, this is for you, not me. One of the things that helps me not do that is knowing that I, even as the pastor, am, am a part of the people that make up the body in Dale Bible Church. And so Paul's speaking to the whole body, the whole body, even the leaders. What is the responsibility of the people if we're going to have unity in the church? Let me give you just two quick things. Notice verse 15 says, rather, so instead of being a child and tossed to and fro, rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So this is the, the growing into maturity that he's already referenced. The leaders are supposed to help the people do. He says, believers are to edify one another through love. Love is a, a clear distinction of unity. Paul exhorts the church to act in contrast to the erroneous practices of verse 14. He says, believers... Each member of the body need to speak the truth in love. And speaking the truth in love is twofold. It does include the practicality of, of simply being honest, but it also includes the reality of speaking the truth of the gospel. Right? If I'm just brutally honest with you apart from the gospel, what, what difference does that make? You're probably going to leave and think, well, he was a jerk. I might have been right, but you probably think I'm a jerk. So we understand that we edify one another by our, our willingness to speak truth into one another's lives. This is where we, we try to reach out to our fellow brothers and sisters and, 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 and try to meet needs of people. You know, maybe we look around and there's somebody who hasn't been assembling. If you think of somebody that you know hasn't been assembling and maybe they're at the second service and you just don't know, here's how about just reaching out to them. Let them know you miss them. Let them know that it's, you, you, you miss them as being a part of the worship and that they, it's, it's really important for them to be in worship if they can and, and different things of that nature. You want to speak the truth, but you want to speak the truth in love because we're trying to build unity. We want to be edified as a body. It's not enough just to speak truth. We must speak truth in love. This is what grows the church up into Christ just about what we say and how we say what we say. What we do absolutely matters when it comes to church unity. And that's what he says in verse 16. So again, he's talking about you speak the truth in love, uh, encouraging uh, one another to grow in Christ's likeness. He says, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds <clears throat> excuse me, itself up in love. So you see, we're going to edify through love, okay, but we're going to equip through service. So the responsibility of the people is to edify through love and to equip through service. Paul says in verse 16, the body grows in maturity, growing to be like the head who is Christ. Only when, only when each part of the body is working according to its function. Catch that? The body of Christ does not function properly unless all members of that body, and I don't mean physical members by way of a membership process, members of the body. You mean all people who belong to Jesus Christ and belong to a local body. All of those people are necessary and required for service in order for the church to function as it's designed. Did you know that? It takes all of us. None of us are more important than, than the person next to us. Listen, I, I get it. I'm the senior pastor. I'm not, repla or I'm not unreplaceable. I almost said I'm not replaceable. I'm not unreplaceable. I'm not any more important than the next person. 
But it's vital that we all understand that we're equally important. That we're equally necessary. If the church is to be unified and function as it's designed to function. Two weeks ago, we examined together the reality that Christ has given every member of the body at least one gift. And if you're a part of a growth group, there was a lot of conversation about uh, what is our giftedness and how do we determine what our giftedness is and how do we use our giftedness in the church. What is your giftedness? Are you functioning as a part of the body, fulfilling your giftedness? I love the way Tony Evans illustrates this reality of the body of Jesus Christ. So he refers to it as a living, uh, functioning <coughs> organism. And in this illustration, he's speaking to the reality of each member working together to accomplish the purpose of the church and to reach maturity in Christ. <laughs> Tony Evans says this. He says, symbiotic growth is the growth that occurs between two organisms where both benefit. Parasitic growth is growth that occurs in one organism because it's feeding off of another. Christians must ask themselves how they are functioning in the organism of the body of Christ. He goes on to say, am I a spiritual parasite? Sing to me, preach to me, pray for me, counsel me, help me, but expect nothing from me. He says, that is a parasite. A Christian interested in symbiotic growth says, yes, I have needs, but I'm willing to give too. Because everyone needs to benefit. In the past few months, for a variety of reasons, some folks have made the decision to withdraw from the body of their Bible church. For many of them, I, I don't know why this reason is. But for others, I know it's because they feel a certain way about the way we've handled the coronavirus. Some have said we've not done enough to ensure their safety. Others have said we've done too much and we're infringing upon their freedom of worship. Others yet have expressed that we should be doing ministry in a certain way or fashion, while other folks simply feel that they are no longer getting what they need out of their Bible church. And my goal this morning is not, not to be the Holy Spirit. It never is. But I would be amiss to preach on unity and our responsibility in and to our church and not ask if we are too focused upon ourselves. I've come to have a great disdain for American Christianity. I had lunch with the overseas missionaries the other day and we were talking about this. I can't stand American Christianity. And when I speak of American Christianity, I mean American Christianity that's predicated upon me saying I believe in Jesus and then that Christianity from that point not being built upon the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God, but rather being built upon my comfort, my safety, and my preferences. Please hear me when I seek to say this gently. The church does not exist for any person's individual comfort, safety, or preferences. The church of Jesus Christ exists to make disciples whereby the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified. And so as we finish this morning, we're considering our responsibility to unity within the church by utilizing our gifts for the benefit of others and the betterment of the world. I would simply ask you to prayerfully consider as you move forward if the decisions that are being made about your responsibility to the church are more about you than they are about the body. Please know that I'm not telling or encouraging anyone to act in reckless abandonment. But we do well this morning to consider exactly what our responses and motivations are when we make decisions when it comes to church. Nordale Bible Church or any other church can function without each and every individual member of the body functioning as it was intended by Christ when he gifted the members of his church. As I've alluded to already, I earnestly believe that a day is coming when church will be much more difficult than it is today. I said a moment ago that I don't want to try to be the Holy Spirit for anybody. 
And I do want to encourage you this morning as we finish to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in order that you can be sure that you understand the purpose of the church and your responsibility within it. Let's pray to God. God, I am so thankful for who you are. And I am so thankful for your faithfulness. God, I'm so thankful this morning for you being at work in our midst, regardless of the circumstances. I'm thankful today, God, for your promise to never leave us nor forsake us. But God, that doesn't mean that we can't make decisions that, that cause us as a whole and as a body to forfeit your blessings. And so I would pray this morning, God, that you would work in the hearts of your people. That you would convict where conviction is needed. That you would challenge where challenge is needed. And God, as I've said, I don't want to be the Holy Spirit of anybody. And I, I pray that my words this morning have been clear, have been understandable. That God, they could be used by your Spirit. And again, I want to reiterate, the desire is not for anybody to, wreck, to answer with reckless abandonment. God, I would pray this morning that you would search our hearts, that you would expose to us motivations and our reasons for the decisions that we make and, and, and as we consider going forward and, and seeking to preserve and maintain unity. God, help, help us here at Dale Bible Church to understand and recognize that we all have a function. We all have a purpose. When any of us are not functioning according to our purpose, the whole body suffers. God, every one of us in this room knows the pain of stubbing their toe. And we know the reality of how that affects and impacts the, the next few moments of our, our life. God, help us to see this morning that when it comes to the church, we don't just impact a few moments impacts our lives for weeks, months, and decades. You've called us to be unified. You've called us to grow in maturity in Jesus Christ. We pray today, God, that you would help us. That you would, as we're getting ready to sing, God, that you would take our lives. That we would make them yours. That you would do with them as you see fit. You are a sovereign king, reigning and ruling over this universe, and nothing catches you by surprise. This morning, God, I pray that you would break our walls, that you would just, maybe today would be the day where we would say, God, take our lives. Let them be all for you. Use them for your glory, God, and for the good of our body. Reach the world that so desperately needs you. We pray today, God, that you would work and that you would be glorified.
consider um, you know, the decisions that we're making and the ways that we're serving or maybe the ways that we're not serving. You know, could, could God use us? Are we being utilized to our giftedness? Because when we're not, it affects the function of the body. So as you leave this morning, I pray that you would give some earnest, a prayerful consider consideration to that reality. Again, we want to remind you, a perfect opportunity to serve the body and to help us function here is through the kids' ministries that we're trying to get up and running. And so uh, we want you to know again that we need your help, and it is our desire to not, we don't want to burden people. We want service to be done because people joyfully want to serve, and we don't want people to have to over-serve and, and be overworked. But we need those of you who want to understand it takes all of you to make that happen. It can't just be a few. And um, so we pray that you prayerfully consider how the Lord might use you in that regard as well. And uh, if you're willing to be utilized and to serve the body here, uh, just we encourage you again to use that perforated portion of the uh, the bulletin and drop them off and play as you pass by this morning. Church, I love you. Uh, I can't I can't say it enough. And uh, it's tough. I'm just being honest. And there's been a million things going on. I'm thankful for you. I love you. And uh, I pray that um, you would, you know, seek to really uh, preserve and then to further promote the unity uh, that the Bible Church needs to continue to advance its mission of reaching the lost world. Uh, with the gospel. Thank you for your generosity to me and to my family. We love you. Uh, and we're thankful to serve you. And uh, Aaron, I'd ask if you would dismiss us in prayer this morning. Father, may we, uh, as we leave here, consider uh, the role, the responsibility that you have for us to better the body, uh, to serve one another, and help us to uh, pray through, study your word, to know how we're gifted, how you've gifted each one of us. And Lord, help us not to just sit back, but to Lord, just to serve that gift as we seek to be used by you, as we seek to serve one another. But we know the blessing that comes as our needs are met as well uh, when we jump into service. So, Lord, just help us to meditate on your word and to apply it to our lives uh, for uh, just the edification of the body, but ultimately for your glory. We pray this today in Jesus' name.